The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to the Morris Animal Foundation scientific webinar featuring the work of Dr. Craig Webb. We have an informative half hour plan for you today. My name is Leslie Hansen and I will be moderating today's webinar. Before we get started, I would like to review a few housekeeping items. To eliminate background noise, you have been placed on mute. If you have questions at any time, please use the question feature that should appear on the right-hand side of your screen. At the end of Dr. Webb's presentation, we will hopefully have time to answer a few questions. Dr. Webb has graciously agreed to respond to questions we aren't able to get to, and those will be emailed out by the end of next week. Before we get to Dr. Webb's presentation, I am pleased to introduce Dr. Wayne Jensen, Morris Animal Foundation's Chief Scientific Officer, who will say a few words about the Foundation. Hello everyone, welcome. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our Foundation to many of you. Our Foundation was formed 65 years ago by Dr. Mark Morris Sr. You know, one of the favorite quotes I have from Dr. Dr. Morris is the one that where he stated, they've given us so much, isn't it time we gave something back? And truly, Dr. Mark Morris Sr. did exactly that. 65 years ago, he founded the Morris Animal Foundation, and today we are the global leader in investing in science to advance veterinary medicine for the benefit of dogs, cats, horses, and wildlife. To date, Morse Animal Foundation has funded more than $70 million. And we've done that um, by funding more than 2,000 studies. Our volunteer scientific advisors identify studies that are going to have the greatest impact and have the highest scientific merit. This ensures that we are funding those things that are going to those studies that are going to make the greatest difference for dogs, cats, horses, and wildlife. We are dependent on donations from animal lovers, veterinarians, associations, and corporations to allow us to fund these great studies. And I think it speaks an amazing, <laughs> amazingly that we have achieved Charity Navigator's highest rating, that being the four-star rating. At any given time, Morris Animal Foundation is funding approximately 300 studies. These studies include grants to researchers to address diseases of companion animals and wildlife, grants to, for research fellowships to train the next generation of scientists, awards to veterinary students as part of our Veterinary Student Scholar Program to introduce these students to research in hopes of encouraging them encouraging them to consider a career in veterinary medical research. We also fund donor-initiated study, studies, and most recently we have embarked on a program where we fund studies where Morse Animal Foundation is actually managing the research. The first of these studies are operated under the umbrella of our Canine Lifetime Health Project, and the first study is our Golden Retriever Lifetime Study, where we are enrolling 3,000 golden retrievers under the age of two and following them throughout their life. This graph gives an indication of the breadth of our studies that we fund and also to some extent the, the focus. You can see that the primary categories are infectious disease, cancer, and genetics. The reason for this is these are the diseases that have the greatest impact on our companion animals and wildlife. But as technologies change and time changes, the relative proportion of these studies change, and that's just a reflection on how responsive our scientific advisory board is to the current needs of animals. If you look at our, the percent funding, currently about a third of our funding goes to fund dogs. 
And then the rest is split equally amongst wildlife, horses, and cats. To date, when we look at some of the successes that Morris Animal Foundation's funding has been able to um, accomplish, we see more effective chemotherapy treatments, improved diagnostic tools and genetic tests for diseases affecting dogs, cats, horses, and wildlife. Um, some of our early work that we funded led to vaccines for parvovirus in dogs, feline leukemia virus in cats, and valley fever in horses. In addition, we have um, um, improved the dietary management of kidney disease in dogs, diabetes in cats, and a syndrome called tying up in horses. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Greg, Craig Webb, who is an associate professor of internal medicine at Colorado State University. Over the last few years, Morris Animal Foundation has provided Dr. Webb with more than $130,000 in funding to study diseases that affect cats, and primarily diabetes and inflammatory bowel disease. So please welcome Dr. Webb. Hi guys, uh, thanks so much for uh, joining us today for this, this very special event uh, and thanks of course to Morris Animal Foundation not only for today but uh, for the tremendous amounts of support they've given to, to veterinary schools and veterinary researchers just, uh, just like myself. Um, so that being said, uh, what I'd like to share with you today is a little bit of work we've done trying to help uh, cats who have, are suffering from vomiting and diarrhea. Now, as, as Dr. Jensen mentioned, uh, I'm at Colorado State University. I'm actually with the internal medicine group there, and that's, that's relevant to this presentation for a couple of reasons I'd like to share with you. For one, uh, I'm a clinician first, and so I'm very interested in clinically relevant research, and it turns out that Morris Animal Foundation is really one of the few organizations that targets just that kind of work. So. Uh, uh, they're really a, a very relevant and very important source for those of us, again, on the clinic floor. Uh, also of relevance to today's presentation is that I'm an internist. So I do internal medicine sort of stuff, which makes me distinctly different, for instance, from a surgeon. A surgeon's job is in many ways relatively straightforward. I mean, you see a broken bone and, and you know it needs to be fixed. Now, the life of an internist uh, is rarely uh, that straightforward. We would love it to be. We, in fact, we'd love all of our cases to go somewhat like this one that I'll uh, I'll show you next. If I can get the next slide. So this is a kitty cat who presented to us at CSU, a six-year-old female spade domestic long hair. And the owner brought the cat in to us because it had been vomiting for quite some time now. It was, I think, at least six months, as I remember, maybe a bit more. It didn't happen real often, maybe once a week at most. Usually at 2 o'clock in the morning, it turns out. The owner would be woken up by this cat making some of, some of the most horrific noises, as if, as if the cat was pulling its entire insides out onto the, onto the floor. And uh, apparently not that alarmed, didn't get out of bed at the time, but the following morning, always found the cat still alive and looking rather normal and rather healthy. Uh, so that's probably what delayed the owner from bringing it in to, to see us. But finally they thought, well, let's, let's have my kitty looked at it. And not only did they bring the kitty in, but they were on top of it enough to bring in a product of what this kitty had been vomiting, in fact. So if I can get the next slide. So this is what the owner brought in to us. And I'm sure many of you uh, recognize it. Many of you may be picking these up off your own carpet. Uh, but, but in a sense, the owner brought us the diagnosis. This is very clearly a hairball. And so we have the kitty with the presenting complaint. I'm a chronic intermittent vomiter. And now right in front of us, we also have the diagnosis. And if you have the problem, you have the diagnosis, then you have the appropriate treatment, which is shown in this next slide. So clearly, uh, this would be an effective and straightforward treatment for the particular problem that this kitty had, all because we had a very specific diagnosis. Unfortunately, 
uh, vomiting and diarrhea in cats is rarely this straightforward. The diagnosis is very rarely this clear, and therefore the treatment is very really straightforward or clear. In fact, shown on the next slide, the number one reason uh, for what we would call feline chronic enteropathy, so chronic gastrointestinal problem, is a disease we call inflammatory bowel disease. But in fact, the real name of inflammatory bowel disease is idiopathic inflammatory bowel disease. The idiopathic part meaning we don't really have much idea what's causing it. And you can imagine, if you don't really know what's causing the problem, you're stuck trying to guess at just what might be a good treatment for that problem. And as shown on the next slide, uh, the veterinary papers come up with a number of standard treatments for inflammatory bowel disease in kitties, you'd be a little concerned if you knew how little evidence or research there actually was behind these various treatments, just not much. But this is kind of the, the, the formula that many of us would reach for if we have a kitty that presents with chronic enteropathy or inflammatory bowel disease. Dietary intervention is a huge part of it. Uh, prednisone, a glucocorticoid, is really the foundation for many, many cats. Some veterinarians will use antibiotics such as, such as Tylosin. And unfortunately, in some cats, you have to go all the way to other immunosuppressive drugs like Chlorambucil. And so this is a number, kind of a little smorgasbord of attempted treatments for a, a very common problem for which we don't really know what the underlying cause is. So as you can imagine, despite this entire repertoire of treatments, Frequently, the treatments fail, or as shown in the next slide, uh, the side effects of these multiple treatments just aren't great, and they aren't particularly tolerable for either the kitty or the owner. So this is what motivates interns myself to try to do the clinical research to find other alternative treatments that either work better or both work better and have fewer side effects. So, we're, so when we're looking for uh, possibilities like that, one place we can look for some inspiration is to that OK model of cat and dog disease, our little human friends. And that's shown in the next slide. This particular patient is Kenny. He's a six-year-old male intact domestic short hair who has a chief complaint of acute onset and of, of, of an upset tummy. And as you notice from the sign, he's got explosive diarrhea. So a patient who can't really tell you much about what's wrong inside of them, but they've got a significant problem, starts to sound like some of the cats and dogs we see. So then we look to the expert treatment of Kenny, and who better to look for for that kind of treatment than, as shown in the next slide, Kenny's grandma. And what does Kenny's grandma do to help out? Well, she very likely would have tried to convince Kenny to take in some yogurt. And whether or not grandma knew it at the time, what she really was doing was treating Kenny with what we would call a probiotic, as shown in the next slide. If I can get the next, there we go. So probiotics, again, what the probably the active component of that yogurt as far as Kenny's tummy was concerned. Probiotics are living organisms which, upon ingestion in a certain number, exert health benefits beyond the inherent basic nutrition. In other words, beyond the few calories you get from eating some bugs. The most common probiotics used in many products are Bifidobacter and Lactobacillus. They are resistant to what normally happens to a lot of stuff going through the stomach, and that is the ass and bile. And that's why they can still be useful in the intestinal tract. So they get into the GI lumen, and they can be metabolically, metabolically active, and they can even set up shop there at least for a brief period of time. The next slide will show that, in fact, the research into probiotics in humans is extensive. There are thousands of studies looking at the use of probiotics for a variety of diseases, many of them being gastrointestinal. And if you look at some of the larger studies, they've had success in certainly at least a few identifiable human conditions. So probiotics are helpful to humans with antibiotic-associated diarrhea. They're helpful to humans with Clostridium difficile. Etc. So these are just a few of the examples, and it, sh it, and it demonstrates, again, the vast amount of research going into this particular treatment of chronic diarrhea and vomiting in people. 
if we look at the next slide, this shows you it's not meant to be, of course, an advertisement of any kind. These are just happen to be the three probiotics that hit the veterinary market earliest and, and probably are used with the most frequency, uh, greatest frequency by veterinarians. The Purina product, the ProViable from Nutramax, and the ProStora from IAMS. And it just gives you a feel for some of the differences between different probiotics, both in which bug is used, uh, whether a single bug or multiple bugs are used, and then how many bugs are used in a particular pro. So we have some choices out there. These are, again, just a few of the choices. We have choices as veterinarians as far as what we might want to try using as therapy in our cats and dogs who are vomiting or having diarrhea. How about the research that supports our use of these? Well, that's shown in the next slide. And as you can see, not a lot. I believe there are about seven studies total out there and actually only two of them are looking at the use of probiotics in cats with diarrhea. So this is the sum total, uh, and it's just about up to date, the sum total of the research we have currently on the use of probiotics in our kitty cats. Uh, so again, paling in comparison to the human condition. And we'll look at just those two studies that deal specifically with gastrointestinal problems in cats. The first one is shown in the next slide. And that actually comes out of Colorado State University, a study by Dr. Mike Lappin and a, a, actually a veterinary student at the time, Dr. Sean Bybee. So this is one of the students that Dr. Jensen mentioned earlier who gets supported to do research by places like Morris Animal Foundation. And, and I'm sure will go on to do many other great things uh, in his research, clinical research career. What they looked at using a placebo blinded control study, they looked at little kitties in a shelter who had diarrhea. And some of those kitties either got Fortiflora, the Purina probiotic product. Other of those kitties got a placebo. And nobody knew which kitty got what until after the study was done. And it turns out those kitties that got the probiotic, only seven, a little over 7% of them had diarrhea that lasted longer than two days. Whereas those kitties in a shelter environment that did not get the probiotic, 20, over 20% 20 of them had diarrhea lasting for more than two days. Now, you and I may think, well, two days, that's not a, a real long time for most of the clients I see. But if you're a little kitty in a humane society shelter, uh, having diarrhea for greater than two days or less than two days may be the difference uh, in your future uh, to a significant extent. So again, a short period of time, but a very important finding for acute diarrhea in these young kitties in that kind of environment. The second study is the one that we did at Colorado and shown on the next, uh, shown on the next slide. And I wanted to look at, uh, at not only the acute diarrhea problem in these young kitties, but I see more, at least where I, I practice, I saw more of the chronic diarrhea in adult cats. So I said, well, it's clearly uh, probiotics are clearly of some use in these younger kitties with the acute diarrhea. What can they potentially do for these older cats or adult cats with these chronic diarrhea problems? Remember, we're looking back to the chronic enteropathies, many of which are likely to be inflammatory bowel disease. So I gave these kitties the ProViable, the Nutramax product for 21 days in 53 cats. This was not a blinded study or placebo control study, and that's important. I'll, I'll show that. I'll mention that again in, in a second. But we gave these to 53 cats for 21 days, this probiotic product. These cats had had chronic diarrhea that had failed other therapies and, and just persisted. And then we asked the owners, OK, what do you think of the diarrhea now that you've, your kitty has had this probiotic? And that's shown in the next slide. And actually, somewhat to our surprise, uh, the probiotic, at least in the estimation of the owner, was quite a useful intervention. 72% of the owners that had been struggling with these kitties with the chronic diarrhea for some time said the probiotic significantly helped firm up the stool. And we put numbers to it on a scale and all of that. But now you've got to remember, this was not blinded. This was not a placebo control. And most owners really want their kitties to do better. And they want to make their veterinarians happy. So you've got to take that 72% with a bit of grain of salt because of the placebo effect. More importantly, perhaps, for us as researchers now is the 24 and the 4 percent where it either didn't make a difference or, in fact, things got a little worse. So as a clinician, yes, the 72 percent is encouraging and encourages me as a clinician on the floor to say, you know, in addition to these 
dietary changes before we get to the other meds, maybe why don't we think, consider trying a probiotic for a period of time? See if that helps. As then a more basic research as shown in the next slide, that 24 and 4 percent says, you know, probiotics don't work for everybody. If we can figure out just what they're doing inside the cat, maybe we can do a better job of figuring out just who they are going to work for. And that's shown in the next slide. That's the ongoing work from this very same research from these very same excuse, very same cats, again sponsored by Morris Animal Foundation. We've got Jan, Dr. Jan Sokodowski off in Texas A&M looking at the microbiota. We've got Dr. Rossi in Italy looking at the histopathology. Here at Colorado State, we're looking at immunohistochemistry and cytokine levels, et cetera. And I won't go into it much because, again, I'm a clinician first. But the next slide shows us that actually serendipitously, one thing we might have found is that, and this is work done by, you see her off there on the right, Rebecca Timmons, yet another vet student sponsored by Morris Animal Foundation to become a clinical researcher. Well, she has stumbled on what might be a key to whether these kitties will or won't respond to probiotics as a therapy. And that may have to do with how they start out, either their cytokine levels or the microbiota they already have inside them. So wouldn't that be great if we could take, for instance, a serum sample and measure cytokine levels and be able to predict for an owner and a cat, okay, this particular treatment is likely to work very well, or this particular treatment is not likely to help us and we need to look elsewhere. Instead of as we usually do it now, which is try this treatment for three or four weeks and then we'll decide. So uh, just a, a clinical example of the kind of research Morris Animal Foundation sponsors, and the next slide ends it for us. Uh, that we hope will be directly relevant on the clinic floor. In fact, we feel already at least supports veterinarians' use of probiotics in both acute and chronic diarrhea in our little kitties. Uh, and this ongoing work, again, sponsored uh, in large part by Morris Animal Foundation, uh, hopefully leads to a much more specific and effective treatment of what's been a chronic idiopathic problem for us for some time. And so with that, I'll, I'll stop talking and, and, uh, and welcome questions or comments uh, from there. Thanks so much again for, for joining us, and, and thanks again, of course, to Morris Animal Foundation. Thank you, Dr. Webb, for an engaging presentation. Before we get to the questions, I want to take the time to thank our supporters who make research like Dr. Webb's possible. I want to especially thank those who are enrolled in our Loyal Friends program and who have shown their support through a monthly donation to Morris Animal Foundation. You can learn about becoming a loyal friend and other ways to get involved on our website at www.morrisanimalfoundation.org. Well, we had quite a number of questions come in, and so obviously everybody was very attentive to your presentation, Dr. Webb. I'm going to... <laughs> Great a few of those that we have time for. And, um, and then for the audience, we definitely will follow up and email you responses to those questions which we do not have time to address um, today. So Dr. Webb, first, why did you select the particular um, probiotic that you did for this study? Sure, yes, yeah. so we used ProViable by Nutramax Laboratories. One, because if you remember from a previous slide, it's a multi-strain probiotic using lactobacillus, which is at the foundation of many of the probiotics that have been successful in people. And if you use multiple different strains, maybe you get lucky or maybe you enhance your chances of getting lucky by giving the right one. It also has a, a very nice number of organisms. You need a lot of live organisms for a probiotic to be any good. And it's from a very reputable source, and that's key in the use of probiotics. A lot of the products out there that you'll get off a shelf aren't anything like what the label tells you. So uh, as a clinician, I would stick with reputable people that I trust and that I know uh, are going to give me the product that they tell me they're giving me. That's a, a real important point if, if you're hoping this will work and, and trying to be cost effective for your, for your patient and your, and your clients. Very good. So um, some of these questions I might add, I'm going to paraphrase just for mm -hmm. the interest of time. Um, we, one of the listeners asked the question, 
Is IBD mostly idiopathic, and could it be food-related? Right. So IBD, by definition, is idiopathic, but there are undoubtedly a lot of kitties that have food-related diarrhea. And so in a sense, they're two separate things, although the treatment of IBD starts with dietary intervention. But before I got to those other drugs you might consider using in IBD, I would be trying dietary intervention all on its own in many, many of my kitty cats who are suffering from diarrhea. Because yes, many of them will be responsive to changes in diet. Okay. And, and similarly, we've had another question um, wondering whether or not there's been comparisons, or in your study, was there a comparison with those cats that were on a commercial diet versus diets um, designed for an obligate carnivore? Right, great question. Um, so, so we didn't force owners to change their diet. We wanted to keep the probiotic to be the only change, but previous studies have certainly supported the use of whether it's commercial or homemade of hypoallergenic or hydrolyzed diets as a potentially important first step if you're going to intervene dietarily. And the asker of the question uh, clearly makes the important point that cats are carnivores and so their protein requirements will be different than dogs or you and I. And a reputable company making a good commercial product will take care of that in their hypoallergenic and or hydrolyzed diet. Those are complete diets, again, if coming from a reputable source, that kitties can eat irregardless of whether they have uh, a diet or gastrointestinal problems. So those are complete diets for kitty cats, and, and that's usually where we would start with our dietary intervention, the hypoallergenic or hydrolyzed diet. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Webb. That's all the time we have. That's all the time we have today. Thank you for spending your time with us. This webinar will be available on Morris Animal Foundation's website later this week for your review or for you to share with friends and family. Have a wonderful day.